welcome to the backline with Rob and Adam. My name is Adam Colley, Eckerlip of the Second City Main Stage. And my name is Rob Norman. I'm author of the cool improv book, Improvising Now, A Practical Guide to Modern Improv. Number one rule of improv, have a little fun with your intros. Mm. Um, Rob, how are you? I'm doing very, very well. Um, I don't know if you know about this, but I've been I've been going on a little campaign during recording of this podcast um, to get 100 subs so that we can get the URL Bingo Bongo Improv Time www.youtube.com slash Bingo Bongo Improv Time I got great news for UAC what? we cracked 100 this week what? we cracked 100 absolutely the custom URL box has not appeared on our YouTube customization page so I don't know what I did wrong. Um, I don't know if it's something personal YouTube has against me, but I'm looking into it. A lot of people sending me messages, DMs, saying, you cracked it, you got it, you got 100, your dream's coming true. And I, I feel like they feel betrayed because I haven't changed the URL yet. And trust me, man, if I could, I would. If I could, I would, AC. Now... You're talking about your inbox getting flooded. Mm. Mine is getting torn to shreds with people being like, did Rob just gaslight us? Is mm. Rob lying about this whole thing? Why mm. would the back line, more specifically, Rob Norman of the back line, treat us like mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. um, um, is there an answer? Power. It's all about power. Always about power. Yeah, it. it's... Um, when you have the power to get 100 subscribers on a very new YouTube channel, which has been available for years on mm -hmm. podcast format, mm -hmm. um, it really does come down to power. I mean, do you feel like I changed after getting 100 subscribers? Like yes. the caviar, the limousines, don't return your calls, didn't do that when I had 99 subscribers, but now I do it out of spite as opposed to having a kind of carefree spirit. I mean, one day I'll get there. One day mm -hmm. I will have 100 subs on something I did, mm -hmm. but not yet. Not yet. Um, but Rob, sometimes my goal is to get away from you, right? Mm -hmm. We do this once a week and then I just get away from you. Unfortunately, we are going to have to be spending quite a bit of time together. Um, you and I are on our way to Texas. We are heading to the Dallas Comedy Club uh, at the end of May for some uh, workshops and shows. Just like what we do before every tour, I need to find out what the hell are we going to do other than improv in Texas. And we all know what I love. I love me some old bars. Some old architecture. Um, I don't know what the cobblestone situation is there. I doubt mm -hmm. there's a lot of cobblestone. But mm -hmm. I, I bet there's a lot of old, like, cantinas and old kind of, like, saloons, I'm hoping. I don't know if that's too stereotypical. But I'm very excited. Never been to Texas. Um, so if you have ideas of things non-improv related, uh, let us know. But if you have things improv related, you can come talk to us in person either in Dallas or Austin. You just um, canada Texas. You know when people come visit Canada and they're like, well, I'm going to see the polar bears and the igloos, uh, see a moose, see a mountie. It'll be great. Um, you're like saloons. I'll go to the OK Corral. I'll bring a six-shooter. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I love, right? I do that in every city I go to. Give me the thing that this city is known for, this state, this country. Uh, I want to go have a little taste, right? Yeah. And you know what? You're not far off. I mean, I saw some pictures of Fort Worth, and it is exactly what you're imagining. Well, so. uh, please let us know, or let us know if you're going to come visit us. Uh, it'll be, be a lot of fun. And um, Rob, you and I being on tour again, uh, what are you... When you go on tour, do you just follow my lead or are there things that you look out for? So when I go on tour, here's what I'm interested in. Um, the improv theater. Mm -hmm. I'm interested like the in the physical space. Yeah. I'm interested yeah. in the improvisers. Like uh -huh. how do they play? Uh -huh. What, like how do, how do they see improv? 
maybe an art gallery. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I'm good. Really, yeah. that's the, the whole, I would if I was like just traveling. If we're just traveling, not on tour, not for work. Um, I would probably want to go see the improv theater anyway. So that would be like my number one destination. I'd want to see like, where do you play? Like, what does it feel like? What does it look like? What style do you guys play in? So this is really a dream come true for me. I'm so excited to visit Texas. My favorite, one of my favorite of the American provinces that they call <laughs> states or something. I guess. Yeah. Um, well, you and I will be uh, together constantly as we often are but can you imagine if we added a third often. how would our tour be different if we added a third person i think it would completely fuck it up and there's no way to rebound if we added another person so i thought today maybe we would talk about that because it feels like you and i are in a duo most theaters have duos Unless you're a large team, the the other way to present improv is usually a two-person scene, a duo. Probably the most popular way that anyone experiences improv. So why are why are duos fun? Why do you why don't you think we see uh three person scenes as much as we see duos? I think the main reason why we're gonna see duos more so than trios is is probably not an artistic reason at all i think it's logistics i feel like if you're doing a duo it's most like most likely that you're experienced most people when they're starting out of classes they're not going i'm going to be in a duo both me and my scene partner don't know how to improvise (laughs) if you're in an eight person troupe you can hide it's a great place for you to learn um, you're not going to fail as openly on an eight person. Even if your eight person Herald team bombs, it's, you're only bombing one eighth of it. Uh-huh. If you're in a duo and you bomb, ooh, yikes, that hurts. That's like, that's like bombing by yourself. There's less to organize. There's less to schedule. So, you know, if you and I are doing a tour, we only have to worry about one other person's schedule. Makes it, makes it a lot easier. Um, financially, if you are touring, it makes it possible to tour. Like the costs of two plane tickets is very different than the costs of three plane tickets. If I'm being completely honest with you. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, I also just feel like, like duos are about a relationship. Our, our duo is, is deeply embedded in our friendship. And when you add a second person, or sorry, a third person or a fourth person, it becomes less about that relationship and more about the interpersonal relationship of the group. And um, that can be more challenging to navigate on stage as well as off stage too. Yeah, it feels like the idea of having a duo and saying we are a duo is a lot of pressure, right? Um There is no one, at least in an eight-person troupe, you know, one person can have an off night. Three people can have off nights. Three people could not show up, still do the show. But it does feel like even in that eight-person group, you're still doing a majority of two-person scenes. You're rarely aiming to have a three-person scene, but they do come up quite often. I don't know how many people really experience three-person scenes often. But for you, we used to have a three-person troupe uh, that we did quite a bit with. Um, Star of the podcast, Jason DeRoss. Uh, so with all your experience of three-handers or three-person scenes, what are your favorite things about them? Like, what do you enjoy about them, even though they may add a bunch of chaos? Well, I mean, you know, talking about us playing two-handers or playing a three-person show like we had maybe which was me you and jason de ross we did um a mono scene a singular scene i was also in a troupe that did a three-person jts brown which was very intense um for many many years we had a we were doing a montage as three people so when you're playing three-person scenes um there it it feels like you're playing Here's the thing I like about 
smaller groups, you get to play more. You get to do more <laughs> stuff. Yeah. S- sometimes, sometimes if you've played a lot, playing playing on stage with eight people or ten people can be hard because you you have a kind of metabolism that you could probably be in every other scene and be just fine, but that would be incredibly rude. So you spend a lot of your time doing scenes and then checking with the group to make sure everyone's okay. In a three-person troupe, it's on, man. You got to be on stage whether you like it or not. Uh, Two-person scenes usually end up um, having a lot more structure to them just because there's only two people to navigate. With a three-person scene, there's a little bit more chaos. I don't know if you and I would enjoy doing a 30-minute mono scene, just the two of us, because it's so structured. Like, we like popping out of that scene and going to other scenes. But, you know, when we were playing our mono scene with, with Start the Podcast, Jason Ross, there was so much there to unpack. There was no point going to another space. It was literally just about three people trying to unpack all of this chaos. There's, an, there's enough chaos in it to sustain itself in a three-person scene. And we can talk about why it changes so much when you add another person in a second. But, um, yeah, I'd say a three-person scene is a two-person scene with a, a little bit of chaos in it. Yeah, I I do like, or one of the things I do like about a three-person scene is the kind of carousel of responsibilities that you have, right? If you're doing a montage and there's a three-person scene in that montage, someone has to edit from within. Mm-hmm. Then you're probably not going to another three-person scene. You might go to a monologue. You might go to a two-person scene. And so all of a sudden... You were the leader of a three-person scene. You had to edit yourself, and now you are watching a two-person scene, seeing how can I help or how can I watch for an edit? How can I tag out? Like, you're constantly switching what you need to do. But when you and I are in a duo or when you're in a duo with anyone, it's pretty singular what your focus is. But having this carousel really keeps you on your toes. And in comparison to that eight-person scene or that eight person show where you may be, you know, in every third scene, every fourth scene, you kind of have that time to decompress and maybe even relax, take a sip of your drink, like just catch your breath. And that is cool. But when you are really thrilled about the idea of improv, that three person scene really takes all of the skills necessary and condenses it into its, smallest form and that's what is super exciting for me yeah now that you're describing it more it's almost like the three person scene takes your running order of your improv show and makes it into a kind of waltz it's in this kind of three four time and when you think about three four time it's such like a weird time signature it shouldn't be that much different than four four but it definitely is. It changes things up quite a bit. And and that's what it feels like in a three-person improv scene. That there's something about it that, I, I guess because it's it's in packets of two, and then there's always one person left out. And so that's what creates this kind of chaos to it, right? It's not like playing with four people, which I think is way easier than playing with three people. Yeah. It's so strange. That one extra person changes everything. It creates a kind of order for your set, but three people is a lot more challenging for sure. Even that fourth person gives you that breather. Mm -hmm. You're not constantly on the hook for something. Mm -hmm. But in a three-person show, a three-person scene, you are constantly on the hook for something. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what those responsibilities are, right? Like why does adding one extra person cause this to go haywire like what can we do about it you're in a three-person scene what are the things you have to think about in comparison to simply doing a two-person scene well i think when we talk about three-person scenes or four five six-person scenes we take one thing for granted that we are given in a two-person scene and so a two-person scene it's all about the dynamic no matter what we do with each other ac it's always going to be about us so if i walk on stage and go i like apples and you go i'm gonna murder you okay well this is a scene about you threatening me and apples whether we like it or not so it's like you know if i i offer you an apple you threaten to murder me or i offer you an apple and you say that you love me like it's clear that there's only one dynamic 
I'm offering you information and you have a reaction to that information. That is a two person scene and that's, that's very easy for us to navigate. But if I'm offering you an apple and you're threatening to murder me and then someone else walks in, um, Tim, Tim enters the scene and he says, hey guys, come to my sewer, I live there. Well, now we have a choice. Are we gonna do the scene about offering the apple and you murdering me? Or are we gonna do a scene about talking about this weird guy who lives in the sewer? So now we have a decision to make. Every time we speak, we're, we're putting, we're investing in either one bucket or another bucket. And we as a group have to decide what this scene is going to be about. And so group scenes, we like to use something called team dynamic. And team dynamic basically means there's only three different kinds of scenes we can do. In a three person scene, um, all three of us can be on the same team. So we all have the same personality. It's a mirroring scene. We can think of many examples of that. Like for example, on Saturday Night Live, there's that famous sketch, da bears, da bulls. Mm -hmm. Um, All those four characters are the exact same. Another thing that we could think about is that exact same scene, two people who are on a team and one person who is left out. And that's the odd person out. So it's two versus one. And we would recognize that uh, very clearly. For example, it could be two parents chastising their daughter. That would be a two versus one scene. Um, we could think about from SNL, Debbie Downer, where two people are really enjoying Disneyland, but someone just keeps saying bummer things about Disneyland. That's a very familiar dynamic to us. The final team dynamic, which doesn't apply to a three-person scene, would be two equal teams, so two versus two. But it doesn't work with a three-person scene because there's an odd person out. So your choices are everyone on the same team or two versus one. Yeah, I mean, you simply add that fourth person, and now you have that extra option. Mm -hmm. So just reiterating why a three-person scene is just that odd one out of, like, it makes everything more difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so we're basically taking this idea of three people and we're shrinking it down, right? We're, We're trying to make these larger scenes back down to two person scenes, right? We think about, we talk, when we talk a lot about, um, character, when we talk a lot about relationship, um, for me, I always like to think about labels, right? And we talk a lot about labels when we teach, how can I shrink whatever your character is down to the bare essentials? And once we do that, it's easier to expand it. So instead of saying something like, oh, Rob's character, he's really angry at his roommate when his roommate steals his apple juice. It's like, okay, so to get a reaction from Rob, I need to steal some apple juice. Well, I could also shrink that down to Rob is angry. And now Rob can take that anger that he applied to his roommate for stealing his apple juice and apply it to other things because we've shrunk it down. Now we no longer need a roommate. We may no longer need apple juice. So the same kind of thing, when we have this larger chaos, the more we can shrink it down to its bare essentials, a one word idea, a one word character trait, it's way easier to expand it. And so the same thing, the more people, how can we shrink it down to its bare essentials? Yeah, and I think like, you know, having that kind of, those alliances, and and sometimes those alliances shift within the scene, I think, is necessary because either you choose it in your scene or it's going to be chosen for you. Let me give you an example. Have you ever seen the show called Star Trek The Next Generation? Um, you're talking about TNG? Yeah. That's Picard, right? Mm-hmm. Never seen it. <laughs> so um, if, if you were to go to the bridge of the Enterprise, there is a Klingon, which is like a s- spider-skulled alien. There's a Uh, an empath who can read people's feelings. There's like a womanizing raconteur. There's a stingy old British man who pretends to be French. There's a nerdy guy with glasses. There's a robot. There's a doctor who um, uh, doesn't care about anything except for healing people. And, uh, And there's a child for some reason also on the bridge. There's a small child there. And, oh, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's the bridge of the enterprise. 
well, what's the team dynamic there? They're not doing four versus one. But if you watch that show, if you watch that kind of setup, basically in a big group scene where everybody's different, we're still doing two-person scenes because we're only having two-person conversations. So Captain Picard goes and talks to Riker. They have a conversation. Deanna Troy talks. Picard turns his back to Riker, and now the camera pans to them too. Like, the camera is only capturing two people at a time. And if you're on stage doing a group scene, you probably have felt this before. Or maybe you and I start a scene, three people enter, one of those people is very loud, and all of a sudden I find myself walking to the back wall. Suddenly I'm not involved in the scene anymore. So unless you're choosing a team dynamic you, in your three-person scene, it's very possible that you end up being pushed out of the fun. So knowing where you are, knowing what the team dynamics are is important to just to protect yourself and protect your participation within the scene that you're playing. Well, we're talking about three-person scenes. And really there's, I guess, just off the top of my head, two ways that three-person scenes come about. One is the lights come up, three people walk on stage, and the beginning of a scene is a three-person scene. The other is we have a two-person scene. And in the middle of that two-person scene, someone else walks in. So we've got a classic, let's clean up before mom and dad get home. Mom and dad enter. Or just mom, or just dad. We've got two kids wanting to clean up, and then a third person enters. So I can see you're falling asleep as this is happening. Uh, but I think this is from your frustration of people entering scenes. So uh, those are really the, the major ways we get into three-person scenes. We just start with three people, or we have two people and one person enters. Does this change the way you would approach them? Yes, very much so. So um, a three-person scene that three people start on stage together is bold, it's brave, it's interesting, I'm on board of watching it. A two-person scene where a third person enters to fix that scene, not my favorite choice to make. Um, but let's talk about them, uh, uh, both of them. Okay, so, so the first one is three people are starting a three-person scene. Great. Maybe we all choose a deal and we're all very different from each other cool that's fine that'll work what we'll need to do at this scene is we're going to start talking about things i don't know what it might be it might be hey you know we got the three of us just had a big party and mom and dad are going to come home so let's clean it up nah let's leave it well player a says let's clean it up Player B says, let's just leave it. What we need for this scene to work is for you to choose a team. Are you on team clean it up or are you on team leave it? And that simple choice that you make as the third person will change everything for us. Now, it could be a scene where for the entirety of the scene, it's two people ganging up on one person. And that instantly will become about statuses. So we have these two people who have power and this other person who's left out and they're getting burned the entire time. Great, that works just fine for us. But what I often see happening in three-person scenes, which I think makes um, three-person scenes unique and fun, is that these, these alliances switch throughout the scene. So we know that the scene structure is platform tilt turning point. Platform is the setup. The tilt is the game or the relationship, the dynamic, what the scene's about. And then near the end of the scene, usually there's a turning point, which basically means there's a status change or an emotional change. For us in three-person scenes, that turning point often is a shifting of alliances. If I'm on team clean it up, and throughout the scene I decide, actually, I'm on team leave it. Gary's real cool. I'm actually with him now. <laughs> that will feel like a satisfying narrative choice for us because a story requires something to change. So shifting your alliance could be that that story plot point that we need to give the audience a, a feeling of a full scene. So those would be things I would be thinking about in a three-person scene. Even if you're three completely different people, finding ways that you might align yourself throughout the scene. 
and again, if, just to your yeah. point of of there's clean it up guy, mm-hmm. there's leave it girl, mm-hmm. and then there is third character who wants something completely different or has an interest that is completely different than the other two. That's where we run into problems. And and it's okay if third person is a goblin, but if this goblin on their the first time that these ideas are introduced, just have the goblin join a team. It doesn't matter what team it is. After this beat is done, we're not going to spend the entire time talking about cleaning up the house because that's a transactional scene. It, there will be an opportunity for you to give an idea to the scene. The goblin can say, hey, let's eat everyone's bones. And that's going to be a really funny move when the the little boy who just had a party goes, yep, I'm good. Yeah, I think we should eat the bones. What do you mean right. eat the bones? No. But it'll feel truthful because you're orbiting around a dynamic. You're orbiting around – the scene's not about the, the things that happen in the scene. It's about how we cluster and create groups, which will feel familiar and true to an audience. And what is the difference between a goblin and a ghoul? Drastically different. What do you mean? A ghoul's undead. A goblin is a tiny monster. Great. Just just clarifying. Okay. Did, did you, Sorry. Continue. Didn't even know that. Jeez. Because um, remember Boglins? Mm-hmm. Boglins were the little hand puppets that yeah, were those like... Are, those are monsters. They're not... They're not undead creatures okay i don't know okay um let's talk about walk-ons yeah if you and i are doing a scene and someone enters that scene i believe that the third person entering the scene has a responsibility to protect you and i and to protect the scene that already exists um, if you're coming into this two-person scene to make it a three-person scene to shift the dynamic away from what's actually happening, you are basically forcing me to do all of the labor, which is set up the who, what, where, risk everything, because that scene could fail, it could bomb. And then once all of that hard work is done, you're showing up to change what the scene is about. Some people might say, oh, well, I'm trying to help. Well, If I'm in a scene and it's struggling and there's one dynamic, you walking on stage and offering another dynamic will not help me. It's like I'm drowning and I have one life preserver, so you throw three life preservers at me? That didn't help me. (laughs) Help me get into my life preserver. Um, uh, Yes, so... I think if you're walking in, you should be mindful of what's already on stage. And if you're walking in... You're creating a team. So what team are you joining? What are you reinforcing when you walk on stage? Yeah. If we've got um, player one um, and player two, they are worried about mom coming home because they just had a party. Player one says, we should clean it up. Player two says, nah, let's leave it. Mom comes home. (gasps) You had a party. Well, let's leave it. Oh, we've joined a team, and now we can understand why this is a heightening of what was already in place. We are building upon what had already taken place rather than, at the last minute, trying to ditch what was already in place for something brand new. And that is the idea of trying to save something. I always think about two things. One, if you're entering a scene... As long, I mean, we're going to enter scenes and fuck it up. That's just going to happen. We're going to attempt to save it or attempt to do something positive. But as long as the mindset is, I want the people who are already on stage to have more fun than they're currently having. And if me entering isn't going to make them have more fun, then I'll save whatever my idea is for another scene that I begin. Because it also feels like if you've ever helped someone move, And the idea is, come help me move, and I'll buy you pizza and beer. Well, the reason you get pizza and beer is because you did a bunch of work. And that's the reward. And the third person entering a scene shows up just as people start cracking open those beers and eating that pizza. And they get the reward without doing any of the work. So just be mindful 
of when you are entering, why are you entering, and what is the goal that you are entering with? Yeah, I want to add on to something there because I think it's kind of interesting. You know, when you enter a two-person scene, are you creating a three-person scene, like a legitimate one Mm. where the two people who are already on stage continue to participate and are more engaged than before you enter? Or when you walk on stage, are you creating a new two-person scene and one of the people who are already on stage isn't going to do any shit in that and the rest Mm. of the scene so we're cleaning up everything oh this is going to be great it's me the goblin you and i are on stage uh i'm having a stronger i have a stronger grasp on the scene than you do so me and the goblin go off and start having a very funny conversation and you stand there looking like an idiot um i don't think for me that is good improv. I don't think that's. I don't think that's great for our team. I don't think that's great for um, playing shows. And I don't think it's a good look for walk-ons. Walk-ons should be in service to the people who risked it. They should be participating more from your offers. And if you feel like the scene is really not working, then maybe you don't want to walk on. Maybe you want to tag in. Hmm. Someone's struggling, tag that person out, take the driver, put them somewhere else. And I can forgive that because a tag in at least is you doing the work. You got to go in, you got to set up the who, what, where. It's a fresh start. It could bomb. So I I feel like 99% of the time when people are walking on, they really just want to tag in. So we kind of mentioned this earlier about this, these larger scenes and how to shrink them down. But what do we do in these group games in these scenes where we feel like oh my god I'm, I'm lost in this sea of people there's so many people there's there's a bunch of ideas maybe floating around what do i do what do you mm-hmm. think well i think i think we have to reorganize our brain about what your goal is in a group scene like that no group scene i've ever seen succeeds on its own Every group scene that's ever been done in the history of improv has sucked. It starts out sucking. You know, there's this kind of like mythology around improv where you walk on stage, you and I walk on stage, and we both say yes and, and it will just be magic. The scene will just appear for us. And sometimes that kind of happens. Like when I was at Second City, I improvised a scene with our good friend Jane Caruana, and we just wrote it down and it was a sketch. It was a very good sketch. And it was like just magic. It just kind of fell, just came into existence. That doesn't happen in group scenes. There's so much work that needs to be done and you're not going to shine in it. Even if the scene goes well, you're not going to look good. So there are only a few options that you can do. Create a new idea. Say an old idea. Um, or change what the scene is about. Those are your three options in the scene. And for me, I would say the second one is the most valuable commodity I can get. Reinforcing an idea that's already happening in a group scene creates a team dynamic. So we're talking about cleaning the house and there's seven people. Should we clean the house before mom and dad get home? How do we do it? And Adam, you say, I think we should use brooms. And then Tim says, Oh, I got a hose. Let's spray down the house. Hey, I'm going to eat the bones. I'm a dad. Maybe I could tell you guys what to do. This scene already sucks. I can tell you it already sucks because it's not about anything. No one's going, there's no singular focus for it. But if you were to say, let's clean the house. Yeah, let's all use brooms. And I go, hey, I got an idea. What if everyone here used brooms? By doing that, what I'm telling the rest of the team and the audience is Adam's idea needs to be listened to. Mm -hmm. Adam's idea is the team, and I'm on team Adam. Now, if someone else goes, oh, let's spray it with the hose. Cool, you're on team hose. You do whatever you want. But hopefully other people are chiming in going, I'm on team broom. I'm on team broom. That move of saying, I also want to clean the room with a broom isn't, interesting it's not funny you get no reward for it but unless you have that team dynamic clearly identified then you won't know how you feel about things see once the teams are set up you don't have to decide anything 
because you just reinforce what your team decides. So your team could actually be all over the place. It could be making contradictory statements. As long as the team maintains itself, it doesn't matter what the team says. But the issue with these big scenes is it's so scattered, we don't have a focus. And so everyone's trying to decide the scene for themselves, and you just can't do that with six people. And the worse it gets, like the if we keep going from broom to hose to washcloth, people on stage start to get desperate. Like, this isn't working. I'm going to say wackier things. Maybe I can squeeze a laugh out of this. And that's just diminishing returns, right? Someone might get a laugh and then it's like, so now it's a joke telling competition. But even if it's broom, I want to wash it down with a hose. Oh man, I think brooms are the way where it's at. And I was like, yeah, like I got a, I got a big broom. Oh man, I got a push broom. Brooms are where it's at. I still think the hose, fine. Then it is like six people versus the one hose person. It's an imbalance of people but the teams are clearly laid out. And, and, and that dynamic, it, like we're talking about brooms and a hose, like a sketch or stand-up comedian watching this video right now is going, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> this isn't funny. This isn't good. But for us, we're going, it will work. That scene will work because it's not about brooms or hoses. It's about what happens in groups. And I'm sure you and I both had this experience. You're in high school. You're in with a group. Mm, something goes wrong. Now you're pushed out of the group, right? It Suddenly, everyone's on the same team. Six people are on the same team. All of a sudden, five versus one. We're all going to bully this person. And in my case, I was the victim of that. In your case, you were pushing people out. You were bullying people. Constantly. Constantly. Um, it was Survivor. Adam invented Survivor. Um, so, so that dynamic is a thing that we're tapping into. That's the part that's interesting and truthful. That human dynamic is something that we're kind of talking about. Why it's funny is because it's actually funny because brooms and hoses are such a stupid thing to have to, for it to be your battleground. The, the behavior and how we treat each other is the, is the real interesting stuff, but we're just having the dumbest conversation while we play out this quite tragic part of human existence uh, <laughs> that's just a very funny way to wrap it up but yeah it, it comes down to as you said the behavior and how we treat each other rob anything else you want to add about three person scenes larger group dynamic scenes yeah i mean i think i think thinking about that thinking about how you participate how we create participation um if, if you're interested in this kind of work, there is a great game that involves four people, but I think it teaches a really nice lesson. It's called alliances, and here's how it works. You get four people. They're all sitting at a, an imaginary table. For some reason, you turn off the lights. I don't know why. It's just how the game works. You turn off the lights, and everyone starts laughing. The lights come back on, and you're doing some kind of object work. Maybe you're playing poker or eating pizza or something, and one person goes, oh, this pepperoni's good. Someone else reinforces the idea. Yeah, this pepperoni tastes good. Third person, wow, this is yummy pepperoni. Once three people have agreed to the pepperoni, the fourth person is the odd person out. From now on, for the rest of this short form game, anything they say sucks. Everyone mm -hmm. hates this person. And you find out really quickly, well, first of all, it's very funny to watch people rush to try and join the team. And seeing someone not be able to be quick enough to get in there is really, really funny. But also, people finding power in low status. People realizing, oh, I'm the victim. And then going, actually, being the victim is the best part of this game. I don't want to be on the team. I like being the victim. This is fun. How low status can I be? Um, but also just that dynamic. You're literally talking about nothing, but you're getting these huge laughs. Uh, and again, it's just because it's about the behavior. I love it. Well, what do you out there think about this? What are your experiences with three-person scenes, group scenes? Any thoughts? Uh, anything you want to share in terms of advice? We always like to hear from uh, other people's experiences around the world. It's just interesting how other people view it. And so often, it's we all view it the same, but we have a different way of explaining it, um, which is so cool. 
Uh, so, Robbie, we always want people to reach out to us at the Backline Pod on Facebook and Twitter and the Backline Podcast on Instagram to see some cool pics. Um, Rob, anything on stage, off stage that you are excited about that you want to share? I mean, listen, a couple episodes ago, we were talking about Odin and, and V and Billy. Got a lot of responses about that. A lot. My DMs just blowing up being like more myths. Can you tell more myths on the podcast? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'd love to, but like, it's just not fair to Adam because he knows nothing about myths because he can't read. And I thought for someone like you, there might be a nice little book that I just discovered. It's it's a little bit old. Do you know who Neil Gaiman is? Mm-hmm. Who's Neil Gaiman? Author. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, he is an author. Um, he, uh, he, I actually don't know, but I've definitely heard the name. But I don't. I wouldn't be able to tell you anything. I love it. So so he's he's mostly known for. Um, being a, a writer of graphic novels. He wrote Sandman, American Gods. Um, he wrote a couple books on mythology, like smart people books. And uh, I haven't read those. Um, but I was just kind of, I guess I was in a bookstore and I stumbled upon this graphic novel, which is just called Norse Mythology. I think it's from, I think it's from like the early 90s, which he's taken the painstaking labor to create a comic book of all of your favorite Norse myths. Everything that you've ever wanted to know is in these books. I think there's like three trade paperbacks. Um, But I thought it was super cool because, you know, when we talk about myths, Mesopotamian mythology, even Norse myths, they're pretty recent. Our access to these myths, they only kind of came to us quite recently. So when we talk about the Greek myths, They've been around forever. We've always had access to them. Um, you know, you go to any Western city, you'd see a statue of Zeus somewhere. We're always interacting with these folks. And so the stories, the rough edges of the corners kind of got worn down over time if people told nicer and nicer versions of this. But if you were to go for from Norse mythology, there's an Eda that people found in um, Iceland quite recently. or I mean, recent within history. And we've basically taken that story, transcribed it, and brought it out to the world. So a lot of people don't have the same relationship with Norse or Mesopotamian myths because they're a little bit clunky. And it's just cool. This is a book that has made these really cool stories a little bit more accessible for people. So that's my recommendation. Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology. Enjoyed it quite a bit. And maybe you might enjoy it as well, Adam. Who knows? As soon as I... Learn how to put those letters together to create words. I'm in. Um, but I did want to talk to you about something because I know you saw it a while ago. Mm. Finally saw the Batman. Mm. And I just, I can't get over how much I just want to hang out in Gotham. It's so beautiful. And it was like, oh, it was super, I don't know if you... Because like I think they filmed most of it in London, but it was so clear that they tried to combine so many cities. Mm-hmm. So there were so many like there was like shots where it's like oh well that's clearly they're bringing in some London oh that's clearly Chicago clearly L A a little Detroit but it was just so beautiful and it made me uh, just excited to be out in the world like I love the little alleyways underneath the um, L trains the little um, like whenever you see parts of a city where it's like, oh, this building was built, not ever thinking there was going to be other buildings around it. Like this was mm-hmm. built and then they had just had to force another building here and it creates these weird like labyrinth in a, in a city and it just made me really excited. Uh, overall, I really liked it. But the the cinematography, the, the, the way Gotham looks, I think probably the um, uh, Tim Burton... It, the Tim Burton Batman is what got me into like cities mm. like the Gotham really just that and like maybe Ninja Turtles like the griminess mm. really got me excited um, but yeah overall really liked it yeah I was going to ask where this love of grime comes from because it's not about misery for you I, I feel like like there's something about like art deco buildings mm. or older 
Like, I feel like your interest in grime starts at Art Deco and then goes backwards. Yeah. Maybe 100 years. Yeah. And then that's it. That's it. You're like, if I were to take you to, like, a, you know, some ca- castle in Poland, and I was like, oh, yeah, they used to do a lot of crime here. You'd be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very modern, um, very, like, like, um, yeah, Art Deco 50s. Yeah. It just and it's not garbage. I don't like garbage or trash and stuff. It's like just the grime, the grittiness. I think mm-hmm. is uh, is very exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's it's 1850 to 1950 crime is what you're interested in. Crime, Give me a 60s crime drama? No, thank you. Get the hell out of here. Pu stinky bud. Pu stinky. Um, well, Robbie, thank you for another lovely podcast. Uh, remember, we are coming to Texas. If you are in or around the Texas area, Dallas and Austin specifically, um, look out for those dates soon. Classes and uh, shows should be going up in the next week or so. And uh, Robbie, as always, this podcast is brought to you by the Sonar Network. If you like it, you can now hopefully subscribe and add to our Bingo Bongo Improv Time. And uh, you can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and wherever you find your podcast to help other improvisers find us. Robbie, we'll see you next week. (laughs) 